world today continues to be one great mission field, even in countries that have a long history of Christian traditions. The late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, once said, it is not enough for us to discover Christ, we must also bring him to others. Hello, my name is Father Jude Eli, and I represent Western Dominican Preaching Ministry, and I would like to welcome you to our presentation, The Role of Husband and Wife in the Letter to the Ephesians by St. Paul. Of all the letters that Paul writes to a particular church community in modern-day Turkey, that is to say Ephesus, we find the role of husband and wife to be of great concern to some in the more contemporary uh, understanding of human gender and human uh, roles and the complementariness of male and female. Paul does address this issue. Now, like anything else within sacred scripture, the mind of the sacred author, or what we call the literary sense, what did the sacred author mean when he wrote the words, is of fundamental prime primary importance. What did he mean? What was the actual historical situation at the church at Ephesus by which the letter was even written? We believe that Paul writes the letter to the Ephesians at about 56, 58 AD, and it's in reference to certain problems of the church. There was a large group of Gnostics. Don't forget now the church at Ephesus is a mixed community, conferred from Judaism, conferred from Gentilism, those who were once estranged from the children of Israel, namely Gentilism, they, these children, the children of the nations or the others, are now brought into one within Christ Jesus. And so, so Paul wants to say here, look, we are the body of Christ. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are members of his body. We are not two, but one. How do we live together? And what are the real concerns of mutual fidelity, marriage, and the roles of husband and wife. Paul addresses these issues. That's why he writes the letter. So when you look at this letter, especially this rather infamous citation in uh, Ephesians, understand he's writing to a particular audience with rather subjective concerns. And that's how we look at the text. Why did Paul write this letter in the first place? And what is he trying to authentically accomplish? Let's look at the text. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 all the way down to verse 33. The very first line. This is the line that people do not read when they read the line of derision by a lot of people today, all that they read or see is, let wives be subject in everything to their husbands. That's the line that the fundamentalist reads, that's the line that the feminist reads, without understanding the verses before and the verses that will in fact come later. Let's go through the verses. Verse 21, of chapter 5 of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the point. That leads off the biblical pericope. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That sets out the entire Pauline discussion of the roles between husbands and wives, wives to husbands. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. The term that, that, that a lot of people find most annoying, most offensive, is to be submissive or to subject yourself to another. Because the English doesn't do well to the Hebrew and to the Greek translation. To the Hebrew mind. Don't forget, Paul is a Hebrew, but he's also Hellenistic. So you're dealing with two cultures, both Hebrew culture and Hellenism, Greek culture. So when Paul says, be subject to Christ, the word is hypostasis, or to empty out. In another rather famous letter of Paul to the Philippians, he talks about the emptying out of God, or the word of God, into humanity. It's called kenosis. 
Though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and took on the role of a servant or a slave. Kenosis, to empty out, to pour out. God pouring out his love for his creation. So the word of God, which is pre-existent and everlasting, that is always with God, who is Father. When God speaks, the word took on flesh. And the moment the word took on flesh, what happens? God empties his own word out, the divine attributes of omnipresent and total knowledge is now focalized into humanity. And he empties out and becomes one like us. The word of God, which we know to be Jesus, of Nazareth, empties himself. It's called the Kenotic Hymn, the Pauline Kenotic Hymn. It's a hymn of praise to God through Christ, who was obedient even unto death, death on a cross. That's how much he empties out for the love of us. It's that understanding of hypostasis that we now have in Ephesians chapter 5. That is exactly what Paul means. So as God emptied himself out for love of us, total abandonment of his divine prerogatives, the word of God empties out and takes on the form one like us. Finite, not infinite. Limited, not unlimited. That's the point. So when Paul says, be subject to one another out of reverence or out of awe to Christ. Why? Because we're all Christian. We're all members of the same body. We have fundamental equal rights with, with, with one another. Equality doesn't mean sameness, because we are not the same. Male and female, we are not the same. And yet, within Christ Jesus, to believe in Christ Jesus because in Christ Jesus there's neither male nor female, slave or free, Jew or Greek, to know Jesus and to be one in his body transcends gender, economic roles, and even laws of kosher, Jew versus Gentile. All that has been obliterated under Christ Jesus. So when Paul says, husbands and wives, be subject to each other out of reference for Christ, empty yourself out for the other. As, as God the Father is so in love with his creation and is consumed by his own love for the things that he has, in fact, created, which, when we go back to Genesis, it's good, it's tov, that's the Hebrew word, it's tov, it's good, what happens? He is in love with what he has created, therefore he will empty himself out for us. That's what Paul means. That is what he means when he says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he says, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. What does that mean? It means that for all practical purposes, the woman is the Christ bearer for her husband, for heaven's sake. She is the life bearer and she is the Christ bearer. So wives, Paul says, submit or subject yourself to your husband Namely, empty yourself out to him as the Lord Jesus emptied himself out to you in a profound love. That's what that means. So wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Yes. Why? Because who are you? Well, you're Isha or Eve in the Hebrew. You're taking from the rib of Adam, bone and bone, flesh and flesh. You're one with your husband. You are married to him. His body is your body. Your body is his body. There's an absolute oneness in the profundity of Christian faith and love. So that's why you will readily subject yourself first to each other. So there's a wonderful sense of complementariness, huh? And then wives says, now you also, you are the Christ bearer. What a dignity that is, my heavens. You are the Christ image to your spouse. What far greater dignity can God give you? 
You are the presence of Christ to your spouse. There's nothing subjecting to that. There's nothing submissive to that. There's nothing degrading in that. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Yes, this goes right back to Genesis. Isha, Eve, is formed from Ish, Adam. Head here means source. You are the source of life to each other. So when Paul and the biblical writer of Genesis talk about head, it means source. And in Genesis, Eve is the helper of Adam, and helper means ezer, or it means strength or power equal to Adam. It's an, there's a fundamental complementariness here. And so what Paul is in fact saying is, ah, for the husband is the source of his wife, as Christ is the source of the church. Well, yes, going back to the Genesis narrative. But you come from the same body. You come from the same flesh. You come from the same bone. For the Hebrew mind, equality, complementariness. That's what Paul is talking about. And so he will say the following. As the church is subject to Christ, namely the church, namely the body of Christ, the, the assembly of God, is also emptying out for Christ or is subject to Christ, Paul will say, so wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Everything is a problematic word. What does that mean? Do, does that mean I obey everything my husband tells me? Paul is not referring to that. As the word of God took on flesh, in all things and in everything. So wives, since you are the Christ's image, the Christ bearer, and also the light and life bearer, you too are subject. You are like Christ. Where is the ultimate source? The ultimate source is God. Where does Adam come from? God. Where does Adam come from? How is Adam created? Ish, dirt, dust. Earth, God. God created earth. Earth is good. Earth is tov. God creates Adam and Eve. Both are tov. Where does Eve come? Adam's rib. Why? Fundamental equality. Bone of bone, flesh in flesh. Not an opposition, complementariness. And that's what he's talking about. And then he goes in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her. Did you get that line? This is, this is another line that people don't want to read or have a hard time looking at it. Again, no one comes to the text of sacred scripture without pre-life assumptions, pre conditioning or pre-understanding. When we read a text, we come to the text fully loaded with life assumptions. And I think we need to recognize that whenever we read scripture, for heaven's sakes. I think, you know, I think you have to be, you know, theologically honest with yourself, intellectually honest with yourself. What do you bring the text? What good things do you bring to the text? What not so good things to the text? What life experiences do you bring to the text that weren't so good? Which ones that, which life experiences have you had that are wonderful, which you also bring to the text? But, but whatever they are, good or ungood, we bring those things to the text. Absolutely. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how does Christ love the church? Intimately, lovingly, to the point that he died on the cross. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves his church. How does he love his church? By dying for it. There's nothing degrading in the roles of male and female, husband and wife. There's a fundamental equality of emptying out for the other out of a profound and therefore divine love.
That's what Paul is in fact saying. Husbands, love your wives. Now, interesting point here. In the time that Paul writes this, uh, wives like children were chattel in the Gentile world, not under Torah, not under Jewish law. Women and men had rights under Torah because they're made in the image and likeness of God such just as the husband is. But in Roman law or Gentile law, you were chattel. Under Christ Jesus, no one is ever chattel. No one is ever property. You don't own a life. You love a life. That's why Paul says, husbands, love your wives. They are not property. They are not chattel. They are the mother of your children. They are the life bearers. They are Christ for you, and you are Christ for her. Notice, you are Christ for her. So love your wives. Love your husbands. No? No? as Christ loves the church. That's what he's saying. So there's nothing demeaning or derogatory here. What he's saying is, do you understand the price of your faith? The word of God kenotically empties himself out, took on the fullness of humanity, was one like us in all things but sin, and out of God's love for his creation, he dies on the cross for us. That's why Paul says, wives, be subject to your husbands, and husbands, you better love your wives. Treat them with respect. So it's not a matter of, well, do I have to be obedient to my spouse in all things? Well, what do you mean by all things? Whatever promotes the good of the relationship. It does not mean blind obedience. It means respectful emptying out. Did you get the distinction? It doesn't mean blind obedience. It means a respectful emptying of the self to the other. Now, in modern-day parlance, a lot of people think, well, you know, uh, we are married. The father's head of the household. Therefore, I have a right to make certain demands upon you. That's not what Paul is saying. Yes, under Jewish law, yes, there were certain rabbinical statements about the Torah that would give you or would give one the understanding that, 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 yes, that the husband is the um, head of the wife. That's, yes. But he's the source of the wife as in the creation account because she comes from you. Not over, but comes from. Did you get that? Not over you, as wife or as woman, but coming from you. A beautiful theological symmetry. A wonderful balance. A wonderful balance. So it's not over, it's with. Because you come from the same source, who is God. So therefore, Paul will want to say the following. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, Where does that come from? Well, Paul uses Genesis, of course. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and 20. Yes. Where did Eve come from? Husbands, your wife comes from your own body. Your wife comes from your own body. And, and, uh, And wives, where do you come from? From your husband. Does that mean that you don't have your own sense of autonomy or your own sense of freedom? Paul isn't saying that. Because don't forget, Christ and the church, though madly in love with each other, there is a similitude, but they are not the same. That's the point. There is a wonderful similarity or similitude, but it's not the same. We are like each other. Being husband, being wife, being within Christ Jesus doesn't destroy personal understanding of self, personality, self-autonomy. But it plays all of that into the contextual of, uh, of what? Being emptied out. See, this is what the fundamentalists at times, and, and this is what the feminists simply do not understand. 
A lot of people will quote Paul but will not understand what he is saying. Because you've got to have the faith principle. Which brings up a very essential point when you study sacred scripture. Huh? You do not divorce the word of God from how the word of God is liturgically prayed. You, you do not separate Bible from church, church from Bible, Bible and church from Eucharist. You never do that. When the church started to understand the impulse of the Holy Spirit, raising up people to write these, these letters that were later part of the canon of the New Testament, it's the activity of the Spirit that gives the church the understanding what these words mean. So when you try to ascertain meaning, understand, you're trying to ascertain what did the sacred author mean by what he said, and then ultimately, how has that meaning been fostered and understood, believed, taught, and articulated in the history of the body of Christ, the church. You cannot separate church from scripture. Church and scripture from the assembly of God as the assembly of God lives liturgy. That recognizes how Jesus Christ has constantly been emptying out kenotically in the Eucharist. So that's why in the early church, the Holy Eucharist and marriage were seen as a wonderful unitive sign as Christ empties himself out again through his passion, death, and resurrection, through the Eucharistic celebration. So husbands and wives in the covenantal marriage that they pledge toward each other in absolute freedom, they get the help to be for each other, the source for each other, the emptying out for each other, through the Eucharist, because both are Christ-bearers to each other. The wife is the Christ-bearer to her husband, and the husband is the Christ-bearer to, to his wife. That's why Paul says, husbands, respect your wives. Love them. They are not chattel. They are not chattel. They're made in the image and likeness of God, such as you. So, therefore... For this reason, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, to cleave unto, cleave unto his wife. For the two shall become one flesh. It's a quotation of Genesis again. Notice that whole matrimonial reality going back to the Torah. This is a mystery, and it is a profound one. And Paul says, I want you to get it right. I mean, it's in reference to Christ and the church. God is married to Israel. Christ is married to the church. Human love, matrimonial love, sacramental marriage is a sign of Christ's love for you and your love for each other. However, let each of one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. One final note. When you look at that whole Pauline citation, one thing is abundantly clear. Christ would no more harm his own body since he died for himself, which is us, the body of Christ, the church. So likewise, under no circumstances, when you look at the Christian faith, should husbands and wives ever harm each other? To be a Christian wife or husband does not mean that you become a doormat for someone's misconduct. There's a fundamental respect here. So when Paul says, be subject out of reverence for Christ, understand what that means. Christ would no more abuse the church because his church is his own body. And Paul says, husbands and wives, you will never abuse each other because you came from each other and you came ultimately from God, who is the fundamental source. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. What a wonderful dignity that is.
And so may the word of God, rich as it is, dwell within your hearts this day. I've always heard people talking about Jesus being alive, but I never really experienced the risen Jesus until I invited him into my heart and into my life. Only then did I experience Jesus alive. If you have that same experience, you haven't experienced the risen Jesus and Jesus truly being alive in your heart and in your life, now is a great opportunity for you to, to amend that. Why don't you pray with me? Short little prayer and invite Jesus into your heart and into your life and ask the Lord to reveal himself to you in a real way so that you too will have no doubt that Christ is alive and well and living in here. Okay? Let's invite him. Dear Lord Jesus, I open up my heart and my life to you. I invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and into my life and to dwell in my heart forever. Lord, I ask you to fill me with your grace and with your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord Jesus, to amend my life. Help me, Lord, by your grace to follow you. Help me, Lord, to love you. And help me, Lord, day by day to get to, get to know you in a real and personal way. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for for dying on the cross and for paying the price for my redemption. I thank you, Lord, for that act of love that you did for me. Lord, from this moment on, you are my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for every blessing, for every grace. Amen. Okay, if you pray that prayer, the Lord Jesus is in your heart. No one else can ever invite Jesus into your heart but you. Only you can do that. And if you've done that, God bless you. Because he's been waiting all your life for just that moment. <laughs>